Hello and welcome to Midweek Bible Study called Hump Day. And so we got a great lesson in front of us. We still doing the series. I have learned the F word and we have done some tremendous uh, uh, studies. You remember the first one is how do I forgive? And that word was woo, forgiveness. It really rocked us. And then we talked about uh, the stages of faith. And then last week we talked about, uh, oh, uh, do you have water walking faith? Yeah, that's it. Do you have water walking faith? Well, guess what? Today we're going to talk about fear. That's our F word. We've had two faiths and one forgiveness. Now we're going to talk about fear. And fear, someone said that fear is false evidence appearing real. Woo! What a good definition. And I can relate to that definition. And you know, I, I think I've told you this story. If I haven't, you're going to hear it again. You're going to hear it. And if you've heard me tell it, you're going to hear it again. Well, it, it's kind of comical, and yet it isn't. It wasn't at the time. I woke up one night, and to my amazement, I couldn't believe it, there was this man standing over me at the bed, standing at the foot of my bed. I couldn't believe it. He was just standing there as quietly as he could. Well, of course, I was scared halfway to death, and I I couldn't didn't want to let him know that I was broke. And all I could see, he had this hat pulled down on his head. And so I lay there real still, real quiet. I didn't move. He didn't move. Then after a while, I could hear this noise. What was it? It was my mother snoring real softly coming from her room. And I thought, ooh, if I can hear it, he can too. And I did not want him to go into my mother's bedroom because I knew it would scare her to death. She'd wake up, and there was this strange man standing over top of her bed. Better me take it than her. So I got this bright idea. Maybe if I turn the light on, turn this lamp on by the bed, that the light would scare him and he would leave. So I real slowly, I'm telling you folks, slowly I moved my hand toward that lamp, real slow, because I didn't want him to see I was woke. And finally I felt the switch and turned it on. You know what he did? He disappeared. I thought, what, what, what? All I saw, <laughs> are you ready? Was my hat on the bedpost. <laughs> False evidence appearing real. You couldn't have told me that that man wasn't real. But it was false evidence. I saw, yes, I saw, but I saw my hat on the bedpost. Well, needless to say, I don't put my head on no bedpost anymore. No, 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 not this girl. So that's what we mean, fear. It nearly scared me to death, but it was false evidence appearing real. And that's exactly what our lesson is about. How many times have we been fearful about something? And what is fear? Webster says fear is a distressing emotion caused by impending danger, and I thought I was in danger, evil, pain, and et cetera. And whether the threat is real or imaginary, the feeling or the condition of fear causes us to be afraid. 
Now, let me say, there are two different types of fear, negative and positive. Positive fear is um, a natural sort of fear or protection that keeps us from harming ourselves. In other words, I fear fire. And because I have respect, that's it, respect for fire, I'm not going to put my hand in the fire because I know that what the fire would do to me. So I respect the fire. I respect electricity. And I respect uh, the swimming pool. I, you can't get me going just jump in a swimming pool. No, no, no. I respect the water. And so what we have is a deep respect. And because of that deep respect, it stays safe. So we obey the law of water. We obey the law of electricity. We obey the law of fire. Well, and the same principle can be applied to God because I respect God, not afraid, but fearful. I respect him. I know what he can do. So therefore, I respect him and keep his commandments, and I respect him for who he is. But fear, on the other hand, when it's at work, uh, it, a spirit expects, uh, affect us, takes our energy, takes our vitality away. It, you know, we get to the point where we can't move, we can't do anything, just like in that bed, I was scared to move. And that's what fear can cause. Fear can cause sickness. It can cause heart attacks. It can cause anxiety. Fear. Well, let's look at our lesson. Our lesson comes from Nehemiah chapter 6. And listen to it. Sam Ballard, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gap remained, though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Samballad and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come down. Why should I stop working and come to meet with you? Great question to me. Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sam Ballard's servant came with the open letter in his hand. And see, the letter was open so anybody could read it. And it was designed to be that way. And this is what it said, the letter. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Gisham tells me it's true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel and that is why you are building the wall. Well, anybody knows that's a lie right there. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So, I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, this is Nehemiah talking now, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. See, they were just trying to intimidate us. Imagine they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continue the work with even greater determination. 
Well, in chapter 6, and it's not about to be over with, we see the devil's last ditch to stop the work on the wall, the good work on the wall. Now, if I could, I would ask you, I'll ask you, but whatever you say, I probably would, can't, I can't hear you. Why were they so adamant against rebuilding the wall? I'm talking about the enemy now. Nehemiah and his people were adamant in building the wall, and the enemy was adamant in trying to stop. What's so important about the wall? Well, first of all, you got to remember the cities had walls around them for protection. And they did not want Jerusalem to be fortified, to be protected again. They had torn the walls down. They had torn the temple down. And now here he comes rebuilding the wall. So they had tried using distraction, slander, and now they are going to try a good old fear. Because, see, fear causes worry, anxiety, and nervousness. So they're going to try to stop this important work by using, you guessed it, fear. And twice in our passage, we see the enemy try to instill fear so that they could stop the work on the wall. Well... And the devil is the sinister minister of fear. You hear me now? Hear me now. And fear is the opposite of faith. And faith pleases God. What about fear? Well, let's look at fear. Number one, fear degrades God. It's an insult to God. For his people to walk around afraid of anything and everything, it's an insult to God, an insult to his sovereignty. He is in control. But fear said, no, he's not. I'm going to show you who's in control. Fear be begins to control us. When we allow fear to come in and have its way, it begins to control us. Fear is an insult to his providence. He guides us. But fear said, no, he don't. It's an insult to his power. He protects us. But fear said, no, he doesn't. He doesn't protect you. Okay, <clears throat> let me show you how fear works. When Israel left Egypt, they came to the banks of the Red Sea. And they were afraid. And they wanted to go back to Egypt. In fact, take me back and let me die in Egypt. Now, why were they afraid? I mean, it had only been three days, three days that they had been out of Egypt. But already they had forgotten what God did to deliver them out of Egypt. They had forgotten the ten plagues. And fear comes when we forget what God has done for us. So fear degrades God. And fear degrades our Lord. He is insulted as we forget his presence. Because I don't know how they could forget his presence because he traveled with them 
a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and yet they forgot his presence and stopped trusting him. So God took them across the Red Sea, did he not? Yeah, he parted the waters, took them across the Red Sea, and they miraculously crossed on dry ground. Can I get a witness? Of course. So now all their fears should be dispelled, right? Wrong. What, what happened? Soon they run out of food. They run out of water. And they start whining again. Moses, did you bring us out here in the wilderness to die? Well, wait a minute. He just brought you through this water. Oh, sure. God can part the water. But can he give us water here in the desert? Woo! See, that's what fear will make you. It will make you ask foolish things. And you know what God did? He gave them water in the desert. And to show how powerful he was, he gave them water from a rock and dropped manna in the air, bread from the air every day, every day. God did it. Did that satisfy them? No, because when they got to Jericho, they got to the edge of the promised land. And remember they sent 12 spies into the promised land. Ten come back, griping because there were giants in the land. And all the people became fearful and was ready to go back. But look what Paul says to Timothy. Second Timothy, verse chapter 1, verse 7 and 8a. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Now, so get, get the picture here, get the picture here. Paul is in prison, but he's telling the fellow on the outside who is free to not be afraid. Well, now, Paul, you the one that ought to be afraid sitting up there in prison not knowing what's going to happen to you. Oh, yeah, you know, because your head is not far from Nero's, Nero's chopping block. But he is saying, I'm not afraid. you free, so don't be afraid. So look, here's what this means. Fear has nothing to do with our circumstances. Fear is a choice. You hear me now? So if fear is a choice, so is trust. Now, and that is why I suffer these things. This is Paul writing to Timothy again. But I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Paul is saying, I'm in prison, I know, but I know who's in control who's with me, who's providing for me, who is guiding me. And you ought to know the same thing, too. It's not Capitol Hill. It's not Washington, D.C. It's not the mayor's house. It's not the governor's house. It's God's house. And Paul has said, I am trusting in the sovereignty, the providence, and the power of God. 
And like Paul, Nehemiah isn't focused on the enemy, but on God. And when we are fearful, listen to me now, when we are fearful, we forget three, we have forgotten really three things. Who God is, whose we are, who we belong to, and what God has done for us. Ooh, we. Now, who God is, whose we are, we belong to God, and what God has done for us. Not only does fear degrade God, fear can destroy our lives. Look, Proverbs 29, 25 says this, the fear of mankind is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. A snare is what? A trap. And what does a trap do? It immobilizes. It renders us ineffective. And the enemy wants to trap us with fear. And he, he's got a trap called temptation that will interfere with our work. The first trap, temptation trap, is called the compromise temptation. Listen to them. They want to compromise. Come, come on, come on, uh, Nehemiah. Meet with us together in the plain of Ono. Now, notice this really temptation came when they heard that the wall was built and that there was no gap left. See, they didn't come and say anything when the wall was going up. In fact, they ridiculed, they made fun, they talked about. Uh, they said, <laughs> look at that wall. I tell you what, if a fox jumped on it, it would fall down. So they ridiculed and threatened, but now that they could see the success of Nehemiah. Now they want to lure him down from the wall. And let's talk about this. Yeah, let, let, come on, meet us over in the, the plane. Oh, I mean, why I got to go over there? Why can't you come and we talk right here? Why I got to go over there? Because they want to stop the work. I'm telling you. Satan knows how to play the fox when it doesn't suit him to roar as a lion. And Satan is a lion walking to and fro, up and down, roaring, see who he can deceive. But when it doesn't suit him, all that roaring and it doesn't intimidate, now let me come sly as a fox. And my sisters and brothers, we cannot afford to be ignorant of his devices. When the enemy speaks well of you, be on guard. Be on guard. Because there is a motive behind. There's a reason behind why he's speaking nicely to you. This morning, he didn't even speak. And now, this afternoon, he's speaking nicely. What's up with that? We need to know the devices of our enemy. And notice how Nehemiah met this temptation. He knew his man. He said, I can't come down. He did not even say, uh, let me think about it, you know, 
In other words, let me give it some thought. He didn't say, let me think about it. He was entirely devoted to the work of the Lord. Did you hear me? He was entirely devoted to the work of the Lord. I'm going to say it again. He was entirely, completely devoted to the work of the Lord. His whole being rebelled against stopping the work to talk with them. Now, why am I going to stop the work and talk with you? Then, not only did he know his man, he knew his work. He said, I'm doing a great work. I'm doing a great work. And if we recognize the work that we're doing is a great work, we wouldn't be so quick to stop and let people stop us with their criticism and they talking. No, no, no. We wouldn't do that. Now, because you see, all of God's work is great work. I don't care what you're doing. All of God's work is great work. Now, I can sit here and think that I'm doing great work. That's fine. But also, I have to know that the work of Sharon Bell, who you never see each week, is great work. Why? You wouldn't see me. You wouldn't get the lesson if she wasn't in place doing her job. Oh, you got to hear me. So all of our work is great work. What? <sighs> the preacher's work, preaching, that's great work. But it's no greater than the person who turns on the light, who turns on the switch, so that you could see. Turn on the microphone. Because, see, many of us don't know how to turn the microphone on. We need, you know, we'll sit there and, and look around for somebody to come and get it working. A great work. And he was doing great work. He wasn't dreaming about doing it. He was doing it. And he knew the danger of coming down. Because he said, why should the work cease? while I leave it and come down to you. Now, it's more honorable work to talk about than just talking about it. Do it. And they came four times with the same thing. Come on over to the plane of owner and let's talk about this. But each time, he responded the same way. They tried to induce fear in him. So he could look around like, oh, oh, here they come again. And Nehemiah recognized Satan's fear trap. And Satan is still laying the same trap today. Now look at this. He used that same temptation with Christ while he was hanging on the cross. What did they say? Come down. Come down. And we'll believe you. Well, you didn't believe him when he was down. So what makes you think he's going to believe it? In fact, when he was down, he did some great work and you found fault with it, he opened the eyes of the blind. Well, he wasn't blind in the first place. He, he cut loose, stamped up with that. He wasn't dead in the first place. And when he called Lazarus from the grave, well, you say he wasn't dead in the first place. You went running back. And so now you say to Christ, come down. Do you know how many times that man has tried to get God to Come down. Now, let me tell you, when God comes down, he'll come down. Don't you ever think that God can't or won't come down? Because Genesis chapter 11, 
Genesis chapter 11. He said, come on, let us go down and see what they're doing down there. Because they were trying to build the Tower of Babel. He said, come on, let us, let us go down. See what they're doing. Then, over in Exodus chapter 3, when he was talking to Moses, he said, I am, come down. I'm going to come down. Because, see, y'all fooling with my people now. Woo! God, I wish you could get this. You don't have to ask God to come down. Don't challenge him to come down. Because I got news for you. It's not going to be long soon and very soon. God is going to come down and see what's going on around here. People sleeping out on the street, acting a fool, indicting a vice, a, a president, a former president four or five times, and he's still walking around thinking he's somebody. God said, I am. I'm going to come down. Oh, yes, he is. Let me move on. So what does he say to us? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Woo! Go tell it to somebody else. Then Satan is not through. He started with, 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 with that uh, temptation, compromise temptation. Now he's going to come with the evil rumor temptation. And you know we love that evil rumor. What I heard. What so you heard? And this is it. And this is what they come and they tell Nehemiah. We heard that you going to point yourself as the leader, as king. And Gisham, he said, yeah, that's what's going on. Well, who the, who almost said something. Who is Gisham? What makes his mouth a prayer book? And that's what we got to do sometimes. We got to say, well, who is he? So they declared he was going to name himself king, and he had appointed prophets to go around and preach and say, we've got a king in, in Jerusalem. And so now they were charging him with having pride, and what he's doing is self-seeking. And the enemy will do that. But it was a design for fear. Because you know it's designed for fear. You know why? Because they say, I'm sure that the king is going to hear this. The king over at Babylon, he going to hear this. He going to come get you. Oh, yeah. You think you something, you going to go back and be a cupbearer. If you get to be a cupbearer, you might get thrown in the prison and get killed. But let me say, he gave them a faithful rebuke. He not only denied the charges, but points out also the source of their mischief. He said, that's, a, that's the old deceitful heart. That's what you would do. That's not necessarily what I would do. That's what you would do. Now, then, and let me say this, the man who is faithful, or the man or woman who is faithful to God cannot always speak smooth things. Now, I, you know, whether you think I done said something harsh or not, I don't know. But I cannot always speak smooth stuff. 
And so what we see him do is what Nehemiah always does. He begins to pray and there's an urgent prayer. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. See, there's a need. What's the need? Strengthen my hands. He wanted strong hands. Not to fight. Uh-uh, not to fight. But to carry out the purpose of God in his life. Strengthen my hands. Not so see, but see us. We strengthen my hands, and then we read to knock somebody out. Because you see, hands that hang down in weakness are useless hands. So he is saying, strengthen my hands. He said, there's a need, and there's an urgency. Because he says, now, therefore, now, therefore, now, now, because of my present need, therefore, because of the strength and wrath of my enemies, and look, Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So he'll take care of you. He will strengthen your, hang, your, your weak hands and your feeble knees. Isaiah 40 and 31 said, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So we said, fear degrades our God. Fear destroys our lives. And now here's what you really need to remember. Fear is not of God. Woo! Fear is not of God. Now, this next statement, You need to keep it in your spirit. If you need to, write it down and post it on your bathroom mirror so that you see it every morning before you step out. Here's the statement. Fear did not come in the world at creation. But at the fall. Woo! God the mighty. Get that. Fear didn't come in the world at creation. It came into the world at the fall. Genesis 3. I'm going to prove my point because I'm in the Bible. Genesis 3, 8 through 10. And they heard, who's they? Adam and Eve. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then... The Lord God called Adam and said to him, Yo, Adam, where are you, dude? So he said, this is Adam, I heard your voice in the garden. 
And watch it. I was afraid. Woo! Because I was naked and I hid myself. I'm telling you, fear did not come into the world at creation, but fear came into the world at the fall of man. That's how come the lion could lay down by the lamb and everything. And But when man fell, ah, that's when everything turned against everything and fear came into the world. I told you that Satan is the sinister minister. Believe me. And fear will come and will bring a lying spirit. Because they, I don't have time to read it, but go back and finish reading uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 6. Shamala, a so-called prophet, was paid to lure Nehemiah into the temple. He invited him to his house and relayed this message. Uh, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple. And let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. And Nehemiah, see, when you walk with God, he'll give you discernment. And Nehemiah discerned that something was not right. Firstly, it hasn't been God's way for him to run away from the work or flee from trouble. And I mean, and Nehemiah said, hey, should a man like me run? Uh-uh. Secondly, hiding in the temple wasn't right. And see, the term inside and within the temple referred to the holy place. And nobody was allowed in the holy place but the priest. And Nehemiah was not a priest. Now, I'm telling you, and it's the one thing that we love to do in the church. So I'm telling you again, run in your own lane. Run in your own lane. And that's what we see Nehemiah doing. He's running in his lane. See, many times, uh, uh, people like to, they will run from one end to the other. I can do that. But were you called to do that? Is that your lane? And so Nehemiah said, uh-uh, I can't go in there because that is the holy place. That's not where I'm supposed to be. And he prayed again. Said, oh, Lord, remember them. Now, let me say this before I sign off. I still got a lot more I want to say, but I've said enough. The next time you are asked to do something and it makes you fearful, that's okay being fearful. Remember the definition of fear. False evidence appearing real. Then claim one of the following verses. 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Psalms 27 and 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. 
of whom shall I be afraid? In Psalms 831, 8, chapter 30, first verse, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Remember, fear is nothing but false evidence appearing real. Now, I know some of you are fearful when the preacher comes and opens up the door of the church. You're fearful that somebody's going to say something, somebody going to see you walking down the, or whatever the case may be. But here, you can join. You can still join. How? By sending a request to New Start at ssclive.org stating that you want to become a member. Or you can call 502-583-6798 and, and leave the message that you want to talk to a decision counselor that you like to join the ranks of the believers. So, or you can just send me an email, gnelson at ssclive.org, and I guarantee you we'll get you in. Remember, fear, false evidence appearing real. Go ahead and do it. You can do it. God did not give us the spirit of fear. See you next week. Be blessed.